Hallo und willkommen. Willkommen? Am I saying that right? I don't know. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to D&D Optimized, part of the D4 network. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons. We theorycraft about them, we crunch numbers, and basically try to create a character that is both really fun but also really powerful to play in-game. Not necessarily to tell you the right way to play a character or the best way to play a character, but to explore one potential way to play a character that is both hopefully fun and powerful. So if you enjoy creating characters for Dungeons and Dragons almost as much as you enjoy playing the game itself, then welcome home. This is where you belong and I'm really, really happy that you're here. So thanks for being here. My name's Colby and I'll be your host. Before we jump in, really quick, um, if you would like to have a written step-by-step -step guide to this and my other builds, please consider joining this channel, if you would, as a member. For $2 a month, you get access to my library of write-ups, which I create for each episode, and then you can have a like level-by-level -level guide to recreate the character yourself, if you would like. More importantly, I think, for most of my members, it's just a nice way to support the channel, help me create more and better content, and so thanks to all of my channel members. And for everybody else, thank you too for being here, even if you can't or don't want to join as a member. Watching the video, liking, subscribing, commenting, all of those things um, are great too, and a great way to support me. So thank you. All right, ever since we did the um, sliding into my DMs episode a few months ago on the draconic options, uh, Unearthed Arcana, that was being announced, I have been wanting to do a character build around the Ashardalon's Stride spell. It, at the time, it was called the Flame Stride spell, I believe, but instantly it got my attention. I thought, this would be really cool. This would be really fun. I can't wait to try and create a character around this. I mean, it seems so cool, right? You get extra move speed and you get to do damage to enemies that you run past because you're just running so fast, apparently you're leaving a trail of flames behind you. And I mean, come on. That's just awesome. And I've been thinking there's got to be a way to make this spell not only really cool, but also powerful mechanically, right? Now, it's it's been out for a little while, and I've delayed actually doing this build because, frankly, on the surface, I think, it seems, or seemed, anyway, not as powerful as I wanted it to be. I mean, don't get me wrong, extra move speed that makes you immune to opportunity attacks just by itself is pretty decent. It's just the whole like 1d6 of damage that a character can only take no more than once per turn that has taken me a little while to get over. What I was, I think I was kind of hoping to see post Unearthed Arcana released version of the spell was a little more damage maybe, or maybe better I think what I was hoping is to get rid of the they can only take it once per turn thing and maybe you could just run circles around a character and do a lot of damage to a single target if you have a lot of move speed or something like that. Just vroom, 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 like a little tornado of fire around somebody or something. Probably wishful thinking, might have been too powerful, but anyway, I think that's what I was hoping for. But this week I decided, alright, you know what? It's time to just sit down and force myself to really try to find ways to get the most out of this spell from a mechanics perspective. And as I've done so, I've come to the conclusion that there are some neat little tricks that we can do to really increase the damage we can get from a Shardalon Stride. And if we can couple that with other things that a character can do, whether that's, in our case, other kinds of ways to do damage, and or things that you can also bring to your party, utility, support functionality, etc, etc, that you can make a very potent, very powerful, and also really fun character trying to build around this spell. More so than I even would have thought when I first started writing the script for this episode. When all is said and done, the character does a lot more damage than I would have anticipated. And I think there's a high likelihood that you might be surprised as much as I was by the time we're, we're finished. <laughs> but that said, yes, I do want to make sure that we're doing things other than just running around the battlefield because if nothing else, I can see that getting a little repetitive. It would be really cool and fun at first. I can see it like if every single combat, all you did was it'd be like, haha, isn't that neat? And after a while, it might be like, I'm just running around. I can see that getting a little repetitive because right, being a speedster is fun and cool. But if all you're doing is just kind of running around really fast, yeah, 
what are you actually doing, right? So yes, we are going to find other ways to bring utility, support, and even some additional single target damage along for the ride, as it were, with this spell and with this build. So yeah, let me mention that up front. This character is going to be unique among other builds that I've done in that it's a little bit of a single target multi-target damage hybrid. Most of the characters that I've built for damage, whether sustained or burst, have been focused on single target damage. A few of them have been kind of multi-target damage. This is the first one that's gonna be a little of both. Now, as we've discussed several times in other videos on this channel, most predominantly I think the Evocation Blaster Wizard and then also more recently the Ascendant Dragon Monk videos. There is value to multi-target damage in D&D, but more often than not, I think, tactically speaking, we're probably better off bringing most or all of our damage to a single target, try and take them out of the fight, you know, as quickly as possible, then we are chipping away a little bit at the health of multiple enemies. If doing so is going to leave multiple enemies still alive and on the battlefield and fighting, right? A dead enemy does zero damage, but a half health enemy still can potentially make life miserable for you and your friends. This build, with its focus on a Shardalon's is going to be doing some damage to lots of enemies, but most of the damage will be to a single target. And, and I hesitated a little bit there because that sort of shifts a little bit as the build matures. But anyway, most of the damage to a single target. And I actually really enjoy having a little bit of the best of both worlds in that regard, because it's kind of fun to be able to do a little bit of both. But just know that when I crunch the numbers to figure out like sustained damage per round, and yes, we are going for a sustained damage build here, as opposed to Burst or Nova, I think it makes sense due to the nature of the spell doing a little bit of damage, but every single round if you maintain concentration on it, right? But anyway, I'm going to be adding up all of the total damage that you would potentially be doing to a hypothetical three enemies in a round, just because I always do three enemies if I'm focused on multi-target damage, even though most of the damage that you do for most of your career is going to be to a single enemy. Sound good? All right. That's my preamble. Let's jump into episode 76, the Ashardalon Strider, AKA the Speedster, the Roadrunner. Meep, meep, the Flash. Nope, I've got it. AKA Greased Lightning. Yeah, that's a good one. And of course, um, as always, check out this fantastic art by my friend Randall Hampton, who creates fantastic characters based on the character concept that I've been sending him each week for the last few months now. I love this piece, as always. Just looks so cool. It's just dripping with lots of character and cool effects that I absolutely love. It captures the image perfectly of how I imagined this character. So thank you, Randall. If you're interested in following him or reaching out to him for a commission, perhaps, I will put links in the video description as always on how to do so. Okay, let's jump into the build. At level one, for our starting class, I want to start off as a rogue with this build, and there are a lot of reasons that I wanna do so. First, doing so lets us bring some nice utility to our party in the form of scouting, trap finding, and lock picking, and like I mentioned, I wanna be able to do things other than just damage with this character. And every party needs a good scout, right? That can find traps and, and disarm them, pick locks and stealth ahead, etc. Second of all, I want to go rogue to help with the additional damage that I mentioned. And third, and actually most importantly for me, for some additional move speed options and even a little trick that we're gonna get to later that's going to synergize really well with a Shardalon stride. And since we're taking rogue levels, I actually like starting rogue here for weapon and armor proficiencies first off, more skills that we get when we start rogue as opposed to multi-class into it later and just instant utility from like a stealthy scouty perspective so when we first meet our hero they are a rogue yes but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a thief or an assassin or even a spy in fact for this character i see them more as a runner, <laughs> a messenger, right? Uh, you might be in like an organized military force, whether political or mercenary, functioning perhaps as like a message runner, helping to coordinate troop movements, or maybe even better, 
in my opinion, as a scout. Someone who sneaks behind enemy lines to gather intelligence. Maybe you're part of an adventuring party, of course, right? Hired on as the one to infiltrate, follow up on leads, survey. You're particularly prized for your speed and your stealth. And you've developed maybe a bit of a reputation even for being able to get into and out of places with no one ever knowing. Or, on the few occasions when you were discovered, you were so fast that no one could ever catch you, so it hardly mattered. You probably ran track in high school. As for our race, I am, yes, going to recommend custom lineage here indeed. There is a feat that I think is pretty important to the build, and it's just simply going to make our early game stronger than it would be otherwise. But indulge me for a moment, if you will, to talk about all of the many alternatives that I can see working really well for an Ashardalon stride focused character. They include, but are not limited to, a wood elf half elf mm, would be high on my list because you get 35 feet of move speed, you get better ability score bonuses, and access to elven accuracy, which I would love to have on this character. A shifter would be awesome because once per short rest, you can shift into like a feline-esque form and get 40 feet of move speed for one minute, among other things. A satyr has 35 feet of move speed. Magical resistance, among other things, really nice. A centaur has 40 feet of move speed, among other things. That's really great. Aracocra, though I know flying races are banned at a lot of tables, if they're not at yours, 50 feet of flying speed and that's insane and there's no reason why you couldn't just fly down low next to your enemies or even right over their heads or something like that to take advantage of and do damage with a Shardalon stride. Now you're more like a jet engine than a roadrunner, right? Halfling actually I think could work really well because they get to move through enemy spaces if the enemy is medium or larger and that actually could be really really useful here. Um, Finally, Orc would be fantastic because they get to use their move speed as a bonus action with some limitations. And if I weren't already going rogue, Orc is the route that I would have gone on this character. And coincidentally, if you want a version of this build that uses the Orc and leans more heavily into the caster aspect of this character without taking rogue levels, stay tuned. And in the final thoughts, I'm going to discuss like an alternative, a Shardalon stride user. Anyway, obviously there are a lot of races that would work really well here. I'm Sure, there's others that I haven't even mentioned that you may be screaming about as you're watching. Herringon, that could well, by no means should you feel obligated to go custom lineage, of course, but it's what I'm going to do. So, as a custom lineage, you get to choose your size, among other things, medium or small. And I'm going to recommend that we take a small creature here because for our free feet that we get by going custom lineage, I want to choose the squat nimbleness feat. In order to take squat nimbleness, you have to be either a dwarf or a small race. And so taking small with custom lineage should qualify us. So have fun coming up with like a cool, unique custom lineage, small character. I think I would come up with some sort of like half tabaxi, half gnome character, maybe? So you'd be like a cute little kitty cat running around the battlefield? That'd be awesome. Let me know what your custom lineage character would look like in the comments. But with squat nimbleness, we get a plus five to our move speed. So now we have 35 feet of move speed as a small creature, which is super fun and awesome. We have proficiency in acrobatics or athletics, advantage on either of those things to escape a grapple, which actually will be really important for this creature because few things will shut us down as effectively as reducing our move speed to zero. And we get a plus one to our dexterity or strength, which means we'll get to start with an 18 dexterity and that's just mwah, perfect when you add all of those things together. So yes, four ability scores. Assuming as always that we're starting off with the point by method, I'm gonna recommend taking a 15 in dexterity, plus two from custom lineage, plus one from squat nimbleness, a 14 constitution, a 13 intelligence, and a 13 wisdom. So yes, we have pretty lousy spellcasting stats for a character who's supposedly built around a spell. <laughs> I'll discuss this more later, but let me just say that for this version of the character that we're building, even though most of the levels we are going to be taking are going to be in a couple of different caster classes, actually, in combat, we're mainly going to be focused on moving around and hitting stuff. So spells that rely on saving throws or a spell attack won't be particularly strong for us. Fortunately, the Ashardalon's Stride spell doesn't rely on us having a particularly good spellcasting stat, so we can get by fine with the 13s that we have. Again, if you want a more caster-focused version of the build, 
final thoughts. As for equipment, I'm going to recommend that we go with the gold buy method, that we pick up some studded leather, a rapier, some thieves tools, and any other basic necessities you may have with whatever leftover funds you may have. As a rogue at level one, we get Thieves Cant, which is the cool coded language that rogues can use to send messages to one another, basically. And then we get Expertise, which lets us take two skills that we're proficient in and double that proficiency bonus for them, or one skill and our proficiency bonus for Thieves Tools. If it were me trying to be uh, the best rogue I can be, again, I'm probably gonna take Stealth and Thieves Tools here, but maybe Acrobatics if we really want to avoid getting grappled. We do already have advantage thanks to Squat Nimbleness, so that might be enough, but your call. And then of course, as a rogue at level one, we get Sneak Attack, which tells us that if we have advantage on our attack or an ally is within five feet of the enemy that we're trying to attack, once per turn we can add 1d6 damage to the attack that we make, so long as we're using a finesse weapon or a ranged weapon to do so. A rapier is a finesse weapon, so as long as we're attacking with advantage or attacking an enemy who's next to an ally, we should be good to be able to apply that sneak attack damage, and that'll be nice. At level two, we can't really claim to be building a character around a Shardalon Stride if we don't try to get the spell early on in the character build, right? I wanted to start Rogue for the reasons that I mentioned, but at this point, we need to try and get that spell as soon as possible. Unfortunately, it is a third level spell, so it's going to be a minute before we get there, even had we just started in a caster class. But at this point in our character's career, their innate speed has caught the attention of a practitioner of the arcane. Perhaps it's just someone else in your party, or perhaps an NPC, or some sort of organization or college of spellcasters. They see something in your speed that they feel they could harness somehow, or train even, that they could enhance, either maybe for their own purposes, or perhaps simply to aid you in the quest that you've undertaken for them, or for the safety and well-being of the other people that they live amongst. Whatever your reasons, we are going to take some wizard levels here. And so, as a wizard one, we get spells, of course, cantrips and first level spells. I would make sure to get Booming Blade as a cantrip. I use it in a lot of builds, I know, but just in case you're unfamiliar, you cast Booming Blade as an action, and then as part of the casting of the spell, you make a weapon attack. If that attack hits, eventually you're going to do a little extra damage in the form of thunder damage, and then until your next turn, if that enemy that you've hit moves, they will take additional thunder damage for doing so. Right now it's just 1d8 if they move. I would also be sure as a first level spell to get the Find Familiar spell, another favorite. It of course lets us summon a familiar, even potentially as a ritual, that we can use to scout ahead and see through its eyes and hear through its ears and things among other utility that it can provide. But also, most importantly, for combat purposes for us, it can take an action on its turn, and that action can be, among other things, taking the help action, meaning that it can give us, or another ally potentially, advantage on the next attack that we make against that enemy that our familiar is helping us with. We get to choose the form that the familiar takes. As usual, I recommend going with the owl because of their really cool flyby feature that lets them fly in, help, and then fly away without taking opportunity attacks so they can stay relatively safe. So we now should have advantage on the one rapier and or booming blade attack that we make each round, which is going to be really nice. I'd probably also, for a first level spell, pick up the shield spell here. We don't currently have any, like, move away from enemies without taking opportunity attacks abilities. So improving our own survivability is going to be especially important early on here with our mediocre 16 armor class. It's not the worst AC for a level two character, but it's not amazing. And our fairly subpar hit points. Alternatively, mage armor would be one AC better than the studded leather that we're currently wearing. So if you think you would be better off with a plus one to your AC for eight hours via mage armor, as opposed to one more casting of the shield spell, potentially go for it. Just know that if you cast mage armor, you will never just barely miss getting hit by one. <laughs> and you will wish that you still had a spell slot for shield. And if you don't, every single attack against you is going to barely hit your AC. And if you just would have had one more, or is that just me? Does that only happen to me? What about the long strider spell? It doesn't require concentration, it lasts for an hour, and it gives us an extra 10 feet of move speed, among other things. Now, that's nice, right? At least for later on, when we're making use of a Shardalon stride, yes, it could be. The truth is, I think most of the time, we're going to have ample move speed to get to most, if not all, of the enemies on the battlefield. So I 
don't see this as strictly necessary. I'd probably take it for this character eventually once I had, you know, more spells that I could learn and put in my spell book for those once in a while times when it might be nice to have. But honestly, I just don't think that we would actually need it for most combat encounters. Also, as a wizard one, we get arcane recovery once per day after a short rest. Um, we get to recover spell slots equal to half of our wizard level rounded up. So yes, for us right now, that's just one first level spell slot, but that'll scale nicely as we grow. At level three, we would be a wizard two, and as such, we get our subclass, our arcane tradition. And I am going to recommend that we go with the College of Scribes. I'm finally doing a scribes wizard, holy cow. Happy day. Okay, let's read what the book has to say about this particular college. Magic of the book. That's what many folk call wizardry. The name is apt, given how much time wizards spend poring over tomes and penning theories about the nature of magic. It's rare to see wizards traveling without books and scrolls sprouting from their bags, and a wizard would go to great lengths to plumb an archive of ancient knowledge. Among wizards, the order of scribes is the most bookish. It takes many forms in different worlds, but its primary mission is the same everywhere, recording magical discoveries so that wizardry can flourish. And while all wizards value spellbooks, a wizard in the Order of Scribes magically awakens their book, turning it into a trusted companion. All wizards study books, but a wizardly scribe talks to theirs. <laughs> okay, I love this description, by the way, and I think it's among the better subclass descriptions that Wizards of the Coast has put out. It doesn't necessarily sound a lot like a super apt description of this sort of like speedy, scouty character that I've been envisioning in my head, but I don't know why it couldn't. You know, maybe our scout is particularly bookish, why not? Or maybe, more likely, the wizard who is training or recruiting them realizes that there's a, maybe a slight gap in their education if they truly want to grasp all that it means to be a wizard. And so they've set them to studying in hopes that they'll learn all that they can from ancient tomes of knowledge. And maybe it worked, and you've now discovered a newfound joy in reading and writing and theory crafting. That's exciting. That actually sounds a lot like me. <laughs> So as a scribe's wizard, we get a couple of cool features. We get wizardly quill, first off. Um, this is a fun and mostly just flavory, ribbony feature that gives you a magic quill that doesn't need ink. It lets you copy spells into your spell book more quickly and erase things that you wrote with it. Ooh, disappearing ink. That's a neat trick. The real reason that we wanted to go scribes, though, is for the awakened spellbook feature. So we now have awakened an arcane sentience within our spellbook, and I just freaking love like the role play and character opportunities that is going to present for us. With our somewhat humble 13 intelligence, I imagine my awakened spellbook is sort of like a tutor for this character almost, constantly reprimanding them, right? Good naturedly for their intellectual shortcomings. Maybe something akin to like uh, Merlin or even Archimedes uh, to wart in the Sword of the Stone, right? No, 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 that's not how the incantation goes. It's when God im Leviosa, not when God im Leviosa. Maybe I would name my spellbook Hermione, or just Miss Granger. Anyway, we can now use our spellbook as a spellcasting focus if we want, we don't have to. We can cast a ritual spell in the spell's normal casting time without using the extra 10 minutes, which is actually really nice. You can only do that once per day. But then most importantly for us, when you cast a wizard spell with a spell slot, you can replace the damage type of that spell with the damage type of another spell in your spell book, so long as it's of the same level as the spell slot you spend. That can be a little bit confusing, but generally it's gonna let us transform the spell damage from one type to another, which is potentially really useful and potent. It'll be nice to help us like avoid damage resistances or even immunities from monsters to a certain damage type from a spell if we really want to use a certain spell on them that otherwise wouldn't work or wouldn't work as well. Say, for example, a shard on stride, which does fire damage. There are quite a few monsters in D&D 5th edition that have resistance or sometimes even immunity to fire damage, so having a way to alter the damage type of a spell we're heavily depending on here will be important. More rarely, there are sometimes monsters with vulnerability to other types of damage, so once in a while it's going to be nice to be able to alter a spell to that damage type, right, so that we can take advantage of that vulnerability. We also will find a really fun way to play with this feature much later in the build, so stay tuned to see how we have some fun there. But anyway, keep in mind that you have to have 
a spell of the spell slot that you're casting in order to take advantage of this, right? So it's a good idea to try to get a lot of variety in your spell book of different damage types you think you might need or want. And you don't have to have those spells prepared, they just have to be in your spell book. And yes, we could accomplish something similar with the Sorcerer Metamagic Transmute spell option. Again, stay tuned for the build that I go over in the final thoughts to explore that a little bit more. At level four, we would be a wizard three. We get second level wizard spells. And I'm going to say a phrase throughout this build quite a lot that you're probably going to get sick of, and it is pick your favorites. Similar to the build that I did for Will Wheaton, actually, um, a couple of weeks ago. I'm running out of cards already. And coincidentally, a Shardalon Stride just works as well. So I could totally see us trying to fit this into that Will Wheaton build. We would have to get rid of Cloud of Daggers, but... Hmm. Anyway, like in that build, most of the spells that you want to get here are going to be things that don't require like a spell attack roll or like even a saving throw because, you know, we only have a 13 intelligence. So yes, I would focus on rituals and like out of combat utility and or support type stuff for this build primarily. Blur could be really nice though for defensive purposes for us. Darkness could be handy. Enlarge on yourself or an ally, but then, you know, invisibility, knock, magic weapon, levitate, misty step, mirror image, rope trick, sea invisibility, spider climb, vortex warp, fantastic spell as I've recently seen firsthand. There are lots of great options for the wizard of questionable intelligence. <laughs> Maybe that's what I should name this build. The wizard of questionable intelligence. At level five, we would be a wizard four and we get our first ability score increase or feat. Dexterity is going to be the thing that will add the most to our damage, not to mention to our survivability, our initiative, and most of the things that we need to be doing as a good roguish scout. Dexterity, OP. So yeah, I'm gonna say let's bump that and take it to a 20. So we're already capped in our most important ability score, which feels awesome. Keep in mind too, at level five now, our booming blade cantrip does an extra 1d8 of damage on hit, and the damage if they move goes to 2d8. And then at level six, we're a wizard five, and we get third level wizard spells, which means we finally get a Shardalon's stride. Now, of course, so many third level spells are amazing, everything from fireball to hypnotic pattern to counterspell. Again, most of these aren't going to be great for you, so pick your favorites, of course, but then I am gonna say, yes, we do need to make sure we get a Shardalon Stride. So let's dig into this spell. It requires your concentration, and you can cast it as a bonus action, which makes me super happy. It lasts for one minute, and then while we are under the effects of it, our move speed is increased by 20 feet, a lot. We don't provoke opportunity attacks, fantastic, and when we move within five feet of a creature or an object not being worn or carried, so be careful that you don't burn the house down, it takes 1d6 fire damage from our trail of heat that we leave behind. There's no save, they just take the damage. This is so, so cool. You're just... <laughs> And again, because we're a scribe's wizard, depending on what you have in your spell book, you could change the damage type of this to something else. For me, I think I would go with lightning just because I love the image of lightning and I think it works really well for like leaving this cool lightning trail behind. It's super flash-esque. But anyway, all sorts of potential options here for us. We are only limited by the spells that we have in our spell book. Now, 1d6 isn't a ton of damage, but it does scale by 1d6 for every spell level that we upcast it, not to mention that we do also get an extra five feet of move speed per additional spell level as well. And we're going to make good use of that fact. So at level six, it is time for our first damage report and let's talk about tactics. Right now, combat starts on round one. We're going to cast a Shardalon Stride on ourselves as a bonus action, and then we will run up to ideally a melee enemy who is not standing next to one of our allies, where they will take 1d6 damage from a Shardalon Stride right as we move up next to them. But then we will use our action to make a booming blade attack against them, adding 1d8 for our rapier, 1d8 for our booming blade, and 1d6 for our sneak attack, plus five for our dexterity, with advantage, thanks to our familiar, and then we will run away without taking an opportunity attack. Now, we currently, with this spell on us, will have 55 feet of move speed. So I'm 
assuming that that's going to be enough to at least run by two more enemies on our turn. Potentially more, but let's assume two for now, dealing 1d6 damage to each. Be careful, unfortunately this spell will do damage to your friends too, so you're going to have to perhaps take a circuitous route in order to avoid harming them. Then, on that enemy's turn who we attacked with our booming blade, they will ideally move up to attack someone, taking 2d8 booming blade damage for doing so. Now, I appreciate that it's not always going to go perfectly like this on our turn every time. As always, we're assuming best case scenarios here. And of course, maybe not best case scenario because there are going to be plenty of times where there will be more than three enemies for you to run around and do damage to, right? But assuming that it does go as we've described above, that would be a total of 4d6 plus 4d8 plus 5 damage spread out amongst three enemies, but most of that is going to be to one. And thus, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would do on average 39 damage per round, and against an enemy with a 15 armor class, it would be 37 damage per round. And I love how like flat the arc of the damage is as the enemy armor class increases on the graph. For those who don't know, check the video description. I post numbers and graphs and compare builds to each other and all those things. Links in the video description. But the reason that that arc is so flat is because A, we have advantage on our attack, but more importantly B, because a Shardalon stride damage just happens without any save regardless of enemy armor class. And you know what? This is pretty great damage for this level. It puts us pretty firmly in the middle of like tier one compared to other sustained DPR builds that I've done to date, even though um, about seven of it is going to be dealt to secondary targets, but still most of it to that single target. And again, if there are more than three targets on the battlefield, there's a pretty high likelihood that you're going to be able to run past all of them with 55 feet of move speed, right? And so that's pretty fantastic. Let's see how much further we can push it. Spoiler alert, pretty far. At level 7, now that we have a Shardalon Stride, I want to go back to Rogue for a minute. I'm a little bit loath to do so because I really want to start scaling the damage that we get from a Shardalon Stride, but there are some really important things we need from Rogue that will synergize really well with what we're trying to do with this character here. First up, as a Rogue 2, we get Cunning Action, a fantastic ability, especially for us, because it lets us disengage, hide, or dash as a bonus action. Now, a Shardalon Stride costs a bonus action to cast, yes, but if we really wanted to, on that first round, we could cast it as a bonus action and then just dash with our action instead of making an attack. If we really wanted to maximize our move speed in that single round, it would give us 110 feet of move speed in a single round now to just let us get truly all over the battlefield and hit as many enemies as possible if they're super spread out. But then, yeah, even better, after that first round, right, we've got a Shardalon Stride activated, we could still make our booming blade attack and then just using our bonus action, 110 feet of move speed all over the map to just fire up as many enemies as possible. 110 feet every turn that's fantastic and, and this is kind of why I feel like like I said earlier you know long strider or maybe even the mobile feet for example just aren't really all that necessary for this character in my opinion sometimes you know we in the D&D community I think like to get really excited about ooh, let's stack all this move speed on a character and see how fast we could move in a single round a billion feet of move speed if we build it right I always kind of look at those builds and go why I mean it's cool and it's fun I guess theory crafting but uh, like it doesn't seem to have a lot of practical application for most builds including this one really it gets to a point where it's like you don't need 500 feet of move speed or 10,000 feet of move speed, right? Admittedly, mobile would be nice, arguably, since it also lets you ignore difficult terrain when we dash. So that will be useful once in a while, but again, I just don't really see it as a must-have for this build personally. At level 8, though, we would be a rogue 3. So first up, our sneak attack damage jumps up to a 2d6, and that's fantastic. But then most importantly, then the primary reason why I wanted to go rogue is we get our roguish archetype, our subclass, and I'm going to recommend taking scout. Ooh, another first time subclass, two in one build. I love it. And I am really actually excited to have a great reason to take a previously unused subclass in the scout. And, and it's just the best thing ever for this build. So 
Let's read about it. You are skilled in stealth and surviving far from the streets of a city, allowing you to scout ahead of your companions during expeditions. Rogues who embrace this archetype are at home in the wilderness and among barbarians and rangers, and many scouts serve as the eyes and ears of war bands. Ambusher, spy, bounty hunter. These are just a few of the roles that scouts assume as they range the world. Yes, 100% on point for this character as I envision them in my head. So as a scout, we get a couple of great features. First up, survivalist. Survivalist is kind of the utility ribbony feature, but it gives us proficiency in nature and survival skills. So make sure you leave those unproficient at character creation. And then we basically get expertise in those skills as well. Now, granted, these skills aren't necessarily the most common of skill checks, I think, at most tables, but I mean, hey, as far as ribbon features go, this is a pretty nice one. But skirmisher, this, this is the real deal for us. So with Skirmisher, we're told that we can move up to half of our move speed as a reaction when an enemy ends their turn within five feet of us. So here's the thing about a Shardalon Stride that I've just been giggling inside about this whole time. The spell description tells us that a creature can take damage from a Shardalon Stride only once on a turn, not on your turn, on a turn. And similar to sneak attack and other things in D&D 5e, there's a big difference between on a turn and on your turn. Because, of course, when you do something using your reaction, you are very often doing that thing on another creature's turn, right? In this case, your movement opportunity would trigger after your enemy's turn was over, and presumably not then on yours unless you're next in the turn order, I guess. Thus, if and when an enemy ends their turn within five feet of you, you could now, as a reaction, cruise around the battlefield again. Now, it's only for half of your move speed, but that's 27.5 feet of move speed for us currently. And that's without, say, the long strider spell active. Ideally, letting you hit a bunch more bad guys with your Ashardalon stride damage. And that's just like Pillsbury Doughboy. Hee <laughs> hee. Oh, that's good. That's awesome. And it really helps us to stretch the damage that we're getting out of the spell. All right, so at level nine, I think it might be time for a change of direction with this character. Now, there are a lot of ways that you could go here. On the one hand, you could, of course, stick with Rogue. You would get more sneak attack damage, as well as, you know, all of the nice utility and defensive features that additional Rogue levels would get us. The thing is, I really wanted to make this character based on a Shardalon Stride, and so for me, I want to try to stick with a full caster so that we can upcast this spell as high as possible as we continue to progress. Obviously, you could just go back to Wizard, right? You'd get some fun abilities from more Scribe levels, and of course, higher level Wizard spells. And there are plenty of great ones that don't necessarily require a high intelligence modifier to be effective. For me, though, I think I would have the most fun with this character by taking, wait for it, cleric levels. So yeah, something has happened in our hero's career at this point that makes us get religion. I don't know what it is. I'm not even going to pretend to speculate here. I'm fresh out of ideas. I am curious to know how you think you would craft a cleric multiclass shift into your character's story here. So let me know in the comments. Maybe all of the lightning spell damage that you've been doing has has attracted the notice of the God of Thunder. I don't know. But anyway, as a cleric at level one, we get spells, of course, cantrips, first level spells. I would get the usual suspects, you know, guidance, which you could cast on yourself for an extra d4 on your ability checks, making you that much more sneaky and block picky. Of course, cure wounds, and more importantly, I think healing word saved probably exclusively for bringing allies back up from when they go down to zero hit points. Nothing really here at level one, I think, that we would use to improve our combat prowess, so pick your favorites. And then at level one, of course, we do get our cleric subclass, our divine domain, and I'm going to suggest that we take the Tempest domain. And I'm sure many of you have predicted this already. Tempest cleric might be my favorite cleric subclass because it can potentially bring both a lot of power and a lot of fun. Plus, like I've said, I really love lightning. As a Tempest Cleric and a Cleric 1, we get some bonus proficiencies. We get martial and heavy weapon proficiencies that we're not going to make much use out of, but keep in mind that we do, when we multi-class into Cleric, get shield proficiency as well. And you know what? That's actually 
really nice and comes at perfect timing for this character, as I'll explain shortly. One downside about using a shield, of course, is that it would mean that our hands are now full with a rapier and a shield, and so it would be difficult to cast spells in combat that have somatic and or material components without taking the warcaster feat. That said, I don't really see us needing to do too much spell casting in combat. I mean, at the beginning of combat, we could cast a shard on stride, then draw our rapier, right, and proceed as normal. Healing word is verbal component only. The shield spell could potentially be problematic if our DM won't let us drop our weapon as part of the reaction that is required to cast the shield spell. That's allowed at our table, but I appreciate that it might not necessarily be at yours. But even then, I think I think I take a permanent plus two to armor class over a once in a while and at the cost of my spell slot and my reaction plus five, but you make the call. We also then as a Tempest Cleric get Wrath of the Storm, which tells us that wisdom modifier times per day, we can force a creature within five feet of us who hits us with an attack to make a dexterity save or take 2d8 lightning damage. I don't imagine us using this all that often. Our DC isn't gonna be great with a 13 wisdom. And I mean, it's not a ton of damage, especially at this level. And we have more important uses for our reaction as we've already discussed. And so for our level nine damage report, then we have added a d6 to our sneak attack, but most importantly, damage wise, we've added another d6 of damage per round to each of our Ashardalon stride victims using our scouts reaction, right? And so yeah, our tactics have actually changed a little bit here. At this point, I think it really important that we try to end our turn relatively close to some enemy because we want them to end their turn within five feet of us so we can get that reaction movement. And this is why I said it was perfect that we got shield proficiency now as before we would probably have ended our turn like far away from the battlefield hiding behind our barbarian friend or something. Now we kind of need to make ourselves an available target for someone. And so against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would do on average 53 damage per round now in total. And against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would do 51 damage per round in total on average. Now, other tier one builds tended to do a little better than we did over the last few levels here putting us kind of like at the bottom of tier one, maybe top of tier two by comparison, but that's still very strong and it's still really cool and really fun. And we're about to take some really nice leaps. At level 10, we would be a cleric too. All clerics at level two get channel divinity, which resets on a short rest and we can use to either Turn undead, forcing undead within 30 feet of us to make a wisdom saving throw or spend the next minute running away from us. Or we can use channel divinity for something else based on our subclass. For tempest clerics, that means we get the destructive wrath feature. And that tells us that when we roll lightning or thunder damage, we can just deal max damage instead of rolling. Okay, so most of the time for us, this is probably going to mean throwing out, say, like a fireball using our scribes wizard feature to change that to a lightning ball and then doing max damage with that lightning ball because we we just roll the dice once and then the lightning ball is going to do that much damage to all the creatures it hits right that's how spell damage works for spells that do their damage to multiple enemies simultaneously and sure a lot of those creatures are going to make their saving throw versus our pretty low spell save dc but hey at max damage even those who make their save will still take a decent amount of damage. So that's really fun and awesome. But what about a Shardalon Stride, you might be asking? What if we changed that from fire to lightning or thunder and then did max damage from that? I'm gonna say it kind of depends, but we're probably not gonna get a lot of mileage out of that. While yes, running around for 110 feet of move speed trailing an arc of lightning behind us is fantastic. And I think I would probably just do that all the time anyway, because it's wicked awesome. But mechanically speaking, I mean, the question is, right, would causing a Shardalon Stride to deal max damage make it deal max damage to every single character that it hits for the duration of the spell? I think, unfortunately, probably not. We're told in the player's handbook that if a spell or other effect deals damage to more than one target at the same time, roll the damage once for all of them. Like, for example, with Fireball, like I said. Now, at your table, for ease of play, your DM may just have you roll the Ashardalon stride damage once and say, 
every creature that takes damage from this spell on this round is just going to take this much damage so we don't have to keep rolling and rolling and rolling. If so, great, but even then that doesn't necessarily mean that every creature you hit with a Shardalon Stride for as long as the spell lasts is going to receive max damage. I would think at most tables it's just going to be on the first character that the spell hits. If I'm wrong and your DM says, yeah, sure, a Shardalon Stride is just going to do max damage for the duration of the spell to every creature that it hits, then congratulations, you've won the Sharda Lottery. <laughs> and you should absolutely do the non-rogue full caster version of this build that I'm going to talk about in the final thoughts. I keep talking about this final thoughts build. I mean, it's not that amazing. It's just a full caster alternative. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm overselling it here. Anyway, for the rest of us who bought a lottery ticket but did not get our number called, it's probably just going to mean that a Shardalon Stride would do six damage to the first character that you hit with it as opposed to three and a half on average. So, ha. I'd probably save Destructive Wrath for something cooler. I mean, Booming Blade is thunder damage. You'd probably get more mileage out of that if you don't want to get too fancy with a lightning ball. On the other hand, you might just want to save your Channel Divinity for Harness Divine Power. That's an optional feature for clerics that we were given in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything that lets us, once per day, for now, regain expended spell slots equal to half our proficiency bonus rounded up. More spell slots are always a fantastic thing, and between this and Arcane Recovery now, we've got a lot of spell slots to potentially play with, which is super cool. Speaking of spell slots, keep in mind that thanks to our multiclassing that we've been doing, we do have fourth level spell slots now, even though we don't have any fourth level spells to cast them with. This means that we can now upcast a Shardalon Stride to do 2d6 damage to each creature on a turn, and that our move speed would jump up to 60 feet now. Giddy up. At level 11, we would be a cleric 3, which means we get second level cleric spells, and I'm going to say pick your favorites. Aid of course is going to give you and or your allies some nice extra hit points and it lasts for eight hours without concentration. Prayer of Healing is a fairly efficient group heal that really you'd only use out of combat with because it's a 10 minute cast time. So if like multiple people in your party are running low on hit dice and need some extra healing. Zone of Truth, Find Object can offer some nice occasional utility. Lesser Restoration is great to have when you need it. Nothing that I would plan on using in our combat. At level 11, remember too that our Booming Blade jumps up to 2d8 on a hit now and 3d8 if they move. At level 12, we would be a Cleric 4 and we get another ability score increase or feat, finally. This is a little bit of a tough decision for me. I'm sorely tempted to take a plus one to Wisdom and Intelligence just to round off those odd-numbered spellcasting stats, but honestly, if we've made it this far with just a 13 in each, we're probably fine to just continue on that way. We're just not a big in-combat spellcaster, frankly, and, and that's not going to change much by getting a 14 in each of our spellcasting stats. So, other options, you know, Elemental Adept is worth considering since it allows us to ignore damage resistance that enemies would have to, for us, I guess, fire damage, and makes it so each time we do fire damage and we roll a 1, we can make it a 2. Yeesh. On a d6, that's like an average bump of 0.17. Why not just let us re-roll 1s like almost every other feat that has similar functionality, I don't know. I mean, even doing that isn't very strong. Anyway, since we're a scribe's wizard, we can change that fire to other things like we've talked about, and the damage bump is almost non-existent, so I probably wouldn't worry about that feat unless you maybe wanted to take it and make the resistance you ignore lightning instead of fire, if we're always transmuting to lightning, so that you can better ensure that your cool new lightning powers work more regularly. I think for me, I'm probably going to do something to protect my concentration checks here. Resilient constitution is nice in that it would give us a plus one to our constitution. Ah. <laughs> Yet another odd-numbered ability score. <laughs> the stuff of nightmares. But then it would also let us add our proficiency bonus to our constitution saves, including our concentration check, so that would be really nice. Warcaster, though, I think ultimately is what I would probably go with here. It gives us advantage on our concentration checks and lets us stop worrying about casting spells with our hands full. So even though we arguably would get more mileage out of having proficiency on all of our constitution saving throws, including our concentration checks, I really like being able to both use a shield and being able to cast the shield spell, among other spells that we might want to cast in combat in a pinch. So I think I'd take Warcaster. We also now do have fifth level spell slots thanks to multi-classing, so we can now upcast a Shardalon Stride to 
3d6 damage and 30 feet of move speed. At level 13, we would be a cleric 5, and we get third level cleric spells. As usual, pick your favorites. Um, fantastic options here. Revivify, of course, to bring an ally back from the dead. Mass healing word for that terrible situation where you have multiple allies that have gone unconscious. Motivational speech is a really nice way to like buff your party with both temporary hit points and advantage on wisdom saving throws for an hour before a fight. No concentration required. So yeah, lots of great options for utility and support, as usual, for clerics. Also, we do get the destroy undead feature here, so on the off chance that we run into undead creatures that have a challenge rating of one half or less, when we use turn undead, if they fail their saving throw, they're just destroyed instead of forced to flee. And so at level 13, it's time for another damage report. Since we last checked, we've seen some nice increases to our Ashardalon stride damage, thanks to spell level scaling, and um, an increase to our booming blade damage as well. And thus, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would do, on average, in total, 105 damage per round. And against an enemy with a 17 armor class, it would be 102. DPR. We have broken the centennial barrier. We've broken the sound barrier. Oh, the sonic boom. That was another potential name for this character. There's a lot of good ones. But yes, I am really happy to see our damage doing so well. A quick note, even though most of our damage is being done to a single target still, as a Shardalon stride scales, that is becoming less and less true. We're doing 63 armor class irrelevant damage now to three targets that I'm calculating for, and then 30 to 40 armor class dependent damage on the target that we're hitting with our rapier attack, who is also taking some of that Ashardalon stride damage too, right? Still, you know, doing 50 to 60 damage to a single target pretty reliably, and then a bunch more to their friends that are scattered around the battlefield is pretty awesome. I mean, at the higher enemy armor classes, this level of damage that we're doing in total here is beating every other sustained DPR build that I've done to date. Again, in total damage, I realize that some of that is spread out amongst multiple enemies. And compared to most of the other sustained DPR builds that I've done, it's not even close at those mid to high enemy armor classes. I'm getting a little nervous. At level 14, we would be a cleric six, and we now get to use our channel divinity twice per short rest. Uh, that's actually a really nice bump, allowing us to like, either do some nice burst damage a couple of times per short rest, or recover spell slots twice per day with Harness Divine Power. But the real reason that I wanted to even go Tempest Cleric in the first place is for the feature that we get here as Tempest Cleric 6, Thunderbolt Strike. I don't see this feature as strictly necessary or even foundational to this character by any means, but it definitely takes the fun level of the character to 11, no question. And it's my, my greatest regret is that it's taken us as long as it has to get to this point. But okay, yes, with Thunderbolt Strike, when you deal lightning damage to a large or smaller creature, you can push it 10 feet away from you. And now I have this glorious image in my head of this character who pauses for a moment before the fight, straps on their safety goggles perhaps, and just tears around the battlefield. And behind them, in their wake, is not only a trail of lightning arcing out to damage enemies, <laughs> but an actual like slow motion trail of bodies just being flung to the wayside. <laughs> the camera is centered on you and you have this just ridiculous grin on your face. And behind you, we just see this trail of dirt and debris and bad guys just in slow motion, just pinwheeling through the air out of the frame. There is no save for either the damage you do with a Shardalon stride here or the forced movement. And what really makes this potentially powerful, in addition to just hilarious and awesome, is that it could let you act as a sort of almost like a sheepdog or a cattle herder, right? Imagine that there's this group of enemies and they're somewhat spread out around the battlefield and you need to, let's say, group them together so that they can fit inside of your friend's wall of force. 
No problem. You just around them in a circle, bumping each of them 10 feet closer to one another, and voila, you now have a perfectly grouped bunch of enemies just ready for an invisible wall to be placed around them neatly. Or maybe you have a friend who can throw down the spike growth spell, and there's a bunch of enemies sort of positioned at the edges of the briar patch, right? You can just around the area, bumping several of them into and even through that spike growth causing some extra damage for doing so. Or, I mean, even if you don't have an ally to synergize this with, no problem, just round up all of the enemies and just blast them with a max damage lightning ball. I mean, the possibilities for taking advantage of this are just endless and so cool and fun to think about. We also do get sixth level spell slots now at this level, so we can upcast a Shardalon Stride to do 4d6 damage to each target and 35 feet of move speed, which would give us 70 total feet of move speed and 35 on our reaction with our scout feature. At level 15, we would be a cleric 7 and we get 4th level cleric spells. There's some good ones here. Death Ward is a favorite. It lasts for 8 hours. It doesn't require concentration and makes it so that if you or an ally that you cast it on would drop to 0 hit points, instead you just drop to 1 hit point. The one that I'm going to say that we really ought to take for this build is Freedom of Movement. It lasts for an hour also doesn't require concentration and would essentially make us immune to difficult terrain or other magical effects that impair movement, including paralyzed or restrained. That's amazing. And plus we can spend a simple five feet of move speed to escape non-magical restraint, uh, such as manacles or being grappled. We can even move underwater without suffering any move speed penalty. And man, we are truly like greased lightning now. We are not only fast and not only throwing out lightning damage, but slippery as an eel. At level 16, we would be a cleric 8. We get another ability score increase or feat. Again, I, I do think there are plenty of options here, but assuming that we took Warcaster last time, I would probably go with either Resilient Constitution or maybe more likely uh, resilient Wisdom here. You know, failing a Wisdom saving throw can be devastating, and taking Resilient Wisdom here would at least make one of our odd-numbered ability scores an even number, right? Because we get to bump our Wisdom by one, and you know, that's going to be helpful even for like the little bit of healing that we'll do on occasion and stuff like that. So I probably go Resilient Wisdom. Our Destroy Undead feature now works on undead that are challenge rating one or lower. We do also get the Divine Strike feature here from Tempest Cleric. Another nice little damage bump because it lets us add 1d8 damage to our weapon attack once per turn. We do also now have a 7th level spell slot, meaning a Shardalon Stride could do 5d6 damage per target on a turn, and we'd have 40 extra move speed from it. And then finally for us, at level 17, we would be a Cleric 9. We would get 5th level Cleric spells. I'm going to say pick your favorites. There's lots of great ones for utility and support here. Greater Restoration and Raise Dead feel like must-haves to me, but there's probably also a place for the communes and hallow spells of the world here, I think. And um, we do get our final bump to Booming Blade now here to, uh, on a hit, it will do 3d8 damage, and if they move, 4d8. And so, for our final damage report, we have again seen some nice bumps to both our Ashardalon's damage and our Booming Blade damage. We've also gained a little bump in the form of Divine Strike, not to mention picked up the insanely awesome ability to toss an enemy that we run past, and some fantastic support and utility options to boot. For what it's worth, as far as the dice go, if we upcast a Shardalon's Stride to 7th level, we would theoretically now, like I said, be doing 5d6 damage per enemy twice per round, right? If we hit three enemies with it, that is 30d6 of total damage from a Shardalon Stride alone. And we can do that every round, potentially, so long as we don't lose concentration. Add to that our Booming Blade attack made with Divine Strike now, and if the enemy moves on their turn, that would be 2d6 for sneak attack, plus 9d8 plus 5 for our dexterity to that single target for a grand total of 32d6 plus 9d8 plus 5 damage that we would be doing spread out amongst three targets. And of course, if we can run past more enemies, the damage goes way up. And so, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 162 total damage per round here. And 
against an enemy with an 18 armor class, it would be 157. My goodness. That's more damage than any other sustained DPR build that I've done to date at this level, even at low enemy armor class. And again, at, at like middle enemy AC and up, it just destroys everything. And so, final thoughts. You guys, you want to know the final tier score of this character if we take their average damage across all enemy ACs and at each damage report? It's 89. That beats out the next best by over 10%. And that next best was the Bladesinger. <laughs> and now I'm having an existential crisis. I mean, so yeah, of course, the Bladesinger is, is my baby and it's my darling. And so I'm immediately scrambling to make excuses. Well, this damage is spread out amongst multiple enemies, so it's not as valuable. Well, this requires that an enemy end their turn within five feet of you, and that won't always work. Well, I mean, that tier score thing, it, it, it gives equal weight to all ACs and all levels, and that's not particularly accurate or helpful. And yeah, sure, those things are all true. My little tier ranking system is super oversimplified and flawed. But still, despite its flaws and oversimplification, it's still meaningful to me anyway. <laughs> and so now, I guess, we have a new frontrunner for sustained DPR, and it's the Greased Lightning. So what are my final thoughts on this build? I mean, I had actually already decided that it was at the very top of my I want to play this character next list, even before I had crunched the numbers. And now it's definitely there. I mean, how can you not love how cool and fun this character would be to play? First, you get to bring a ton of utility to your team with your roguish skills. Next, you get to zoom around the battlefield, striking one enemy, and then peppering the rest of the battlefield with your fire or lightning or heck, bludgeoning or psychic damage or almost whatever you want, eventually you get to be tossing those enemies left and right as you run past them. And on top of it all, you bring a pretty nice suite of support and utility spells with you to boot. This, I think, would be so much fun to play, and I am going to do it at the earliest possible opportunity. Now, I have been promising a caster-focused alternative to this build, so let me go over that briefly. I, th I think we're going long, so I'll try and keep it brief. Here's what you do. You take the orc race, as I mentioned, because orcs can move as a bonus action so long as they end their turn closer to an enemy of their choosing before they started moving. So you don't have as much need now for cunning action from rogue, right? You start as sorcerer, I think, and you take it to level five, maybe six. I think I would go draconic bloodline for a little extra defense and for their elemental affinity ability that lets you do bonus damage of one specific elemental damage type based on the dragon you're ancestrally affiliated with. Make sure you pick up the transmute spell meta magic option so you can turn your fire into lightning later on or another elemental damage type if you want. And then instead of making booming blade attacks, you simply get a Shardalon stride going and then you move on your turn using your bonus action for extra move speed if you need it after round one, of course. But then for your action, you actually just ready your action. When you ready an action, you know, you state what what the thing is that's going to trigger it, and then when that trigger happens, you can use your reaction to do the thing that you were said you were going to do, including using your move speed. So maybe you say, you know, I ready my action to move as soon as another creature I can see moves or takes an action, or even just I ready my action to move as soon as my turn is over, or whatever. Then you can use your reaction to deal more Ashardalon stride damage to everyone without needing to be a scout rogue, right? Now, early on, you're actually going to do less overall damage going this route. And of course, there's no single target taking the brunt of it. Everything is just equally distributed to multiple targets. Now, if at your table you're simply rolling the die one time to determine damage and your overly generous DM decides that you can apply both your elemental affinity damage from Draconic Bloodline and later your Destructive Wrath damage from Tempest Cleric to that single roll, and it applies to all enemies for the duration of the spell, then that is overpowered and you should feel really bad as you giggle yourself to sleep every night. <laughs> anyway, 
After Sorcerer 5, or maybe 6 if you want that elemental affinity, you start taking cleric levels as we've already done. Obviously, you focus here on charisma and wisdom for your primary ability scores. And the nice thing about this is that it lets us get a Shardalon's stride damage scaling a little bit quicker. And we're also going to have a much higher, you know, spell save DC and or spell to hit if we need it for whatever reason to throw out a really important spell. And not to mention that it will, you know, bump the healing that we do if we have a higher wisdom score, things like that. You do lose out, of course, on the rogue utility. It's less damage on a single enemy, um, but there are definitely some pros to going that route. And so, that's the build for the week. It is getting dark outside, as you might be able to tell. I hope you guys had as much fun watching it as I did creating it. I cannot wait to play this character in-game. But regardless, I love you. <laughs> I hope that you are happy and that you have a fantastic day and a fantastic week and that you check out all of the other content uh, on the channel if you feel so inclined and that you like and subscribe and click the bell and do all of those things. But regardless, thanks for watching and I'll see you very soon, I hope. And until then, take care. Go grease lightning, you're burning through the heat lap trials. Grease lightning, go grease lightning, go grease lightning, you something something quarter mile. I'm not. I don't know the words actually. Pinwheeling, <laughs> pinwheeling out of the camera. <clears throat> I don't know what to say. I'm 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 speechless. Pinwheeling off camera, or or out of the frame. Just pinwheeling out of the frame. No, don't even. Don't even talk about that. Thanks to multi cat. Multi <laughs> oh no, we're we're readying our action. No, don't say any of that. <laughs> a spell, a <laughs> why can't I say that right? A um, okay, time to open up these blinds a little bit because it's getting darker. Um, the, the main difference really is Divine Strike does Thunder Damage, Blessed Strike does Divine Damage. Or <laughs> ha. You are supreme! The Jigsaw... You know, if you really pay attention to the words of that song, it is not very child appropriate. I learned this when I was performing the song for like a church musical review. <laughs> We had to change some words. <laughs>